Though a student of Hegel, Karl Marx rejected his obsession with speculation and ideas, and strived to bring the dialectical method into the material world. He favored activism and science, so he called himself a scientist of history. The concept of his science of history was laid out piece by piece across several works, maturing over time, but is summarized like this. Stage 1. History began as a primitive, tribal, communist society where everything was shared. Stage 2. Over time, some people took power over others, leading to dictatorships where the lower people were enslaved. Stage 3. This progressed into the feudal states of medieval times, made of many factions. Stage 4. Capitalism arose eventually, which gave immense power to the economic and political leaders of society. Stage 5. The oppressed lower classes would necessarily grow in contempt of capitalism until they could no longer take the pressure and would revolt, overthrowing the capitalist leaders and installing an administrative socialist state which would stamp out oppression over time until everyone was equal. Notably, socialism would abolish private property since socialism is the public state ownership of property. Then the state would dissolve itself and stage six, communism would arrive, where everyone was finally equal again. This was the logical conclusion since Marx was a secular humanist and didn't believe in the afterlife. Utopia could only occur on earth through revolution, and then good people would finally rule the world. In 1848, one of the most influential books in history was published. In order to ignite the revolution of the working classes that would eventually bring about a communist utopia, Marx published the Communist Manifesto. It's common knowledge that Marx championed the abolition of private property and that religion was the opiate of the masses, but he also believed heavily in applying the dialectic to capitalism. The capitalist pigs took all the money and power, and their opposite was the poor from whom they stole. This dialectical pair, or contradiction, could be exploited to bring about a synthesis and to move along the dialectical process. The proletariat revolution would only take place after a sufficient number of contradictions had all been synthesized, and like Hegel's absolute idea, the proletariat classes would eventually realize their true power. The manifesto took hold around the world and sparked many political movements, but on the timeline of American politics and in this history, the engine of Marxism, the dialectic, wouldn't be brought up again until 1903. In that year, after the Civil War and Reconstruction periods, a writer named W.E.B. Du Bois published The Souls of Black Folk, in which he reiterated the master-slave dialectic of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. This idea posits that a master is consumed by his own world and can't understand the world outside of his own, but a slave knows both his own world and the master's world in which he works. So the slave has what's called a dual consciousness. He alone is conscious of both perspectives. Dubois also postulated that a country is truly made up of a folk, meaning race, so racial groups should be treated like countries. So then the thought shifted from the Rousseauian master-slave relationships to racial master-slave dialectics. For a modern example, some people differentiate between being black and being American. A black American would have two consciousnesses, the American, which is a master, and the black, which is a slave. A white American could only have the perspective of the master, since white and American are part of the same terrible system, but more on that later. Around the time of Dubois, America wasn't alone in its socialist ruminations. George Lukács was the Hungarian Minister of Culture in 1919. He was part of a new formation of Marxism, later known as Cultural Marxism. As the Minister of Culture, he advocated for the liberation not of the proletariat working classes, but of sexual liberation as the driving force for revolution. This was the beginning of a new shift, which would explode in later decades with the writings of Antonio Gramsci, an Italian writer known as the godfather of cultural Marxism. While Marx had advocated for revolt along the political and economic lines, Gramsci realized that it wasn't working as well as it should. In fact, the lives of the working class people in capitalist America were going far better than their parents' or grandparents' generations. While imprisoned in Italy for many years, he wrote what would later be called the prison notebooks. Gramsci centered his philosophy on the idea of hegemonies. From Marx, a hegemony was a description of the dominion that one power has over another. This is the oppressive system Marx wanted liberation from. 
hegemonies included political and economic means by which the prevailing power oppressed others. Gramsci argued that the hegemony was cultural as well, and that it needed to be infiltrated from the inside. This counter-hegemony would be done in five spheres – family, religion, education, media, and law, with a special emphasis on education. This will be important later. Thus, Gramsci advocated for what's now called a long march through the institutions, which means the cultural Marxists would play the long game, slowly turning the capitalist institutions against themselves. As Jesus of Nazareth once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand, and so the dialectic progressed. As a side note, Gramsci is a key figure in this timeline, but his writings were in Italian and were translated into other European languages, though not yet English. The reason his writings were able to take hold in English-speaking countries was due to translation into English done by politician Pete Buttigieg's father at Notre Dame from the 1980s through 2007. Joseph Buttigieg was the founder and president of the International Gramsci Society, an English professor emeritus at Notre Dame until his death in 2019.